Because God had created it, and he called it good. And at the very end of that, he called it very good. He created man and woman in his image. The second image that we do, this one's a little bit longer, so do, do give yourself some space. So this is our image for God because God tells us not to draw images of himself. So this is the first letter that T. How's it going, man? Just get it out. And so God created man and woman. Well, man. And so I'm a really great artist, like I said. And they're in a really good relationship. We read about this in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. That God created man and woman in his image. And they were a good relationship. God gave him one rule, and that rule was to what? Not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he, they eat from it. They choose to go against, guys, listen up. They choose to go against God's one rule. Is one thing he tells them not to do. So God does not separate himself from them, but they separate themselves from God. So we have this awesome squiggly line here that's like broken, fractured. They're no longer in that relationship that they were in with God. And so they have broken off their relationship with God. Oh, he doesn't have arms. Arms are helpful. They broke his arms, Mark. He kind of broke his arms. And so. That relationship is severed. And God does something crazy at the end of that story that often we overlook. God actually sacrifices an animal to bring them back into right relationship. He kills his good creation that humanity would be able... Guys, listen up. Hey, tail, no. So, he breaks his good creation. That relationship got broken. God goes ahead and sacrifices an animal, kills an animal, that they would have clothing, that their shame would be removed. Does anybody remember what happens next? Yeah. But before we get to the, even the water, even the art, what is happening in the story? Do you really remember? You're right on all of that. Like pretty much everyone is evil. And God's like, I'm going to flood this whole earth to kind of start over. His good creation continued to be broken. That humanity continued to do things that were against God's way, against God's will. So he calls this man to build a big old boat, put his family on it. He's going to get every animal times two, and he floods the earth, which is kind of crazy. He floods his good creation because it's, since it's starting over. And then at the very end of that story, we find out there's this beautiful rainbow. rainbow. And the rainbow reminds us every time we see it, even today. Oh, yeah, there's got to be a cloud. Oh, on these. My bad. So it's like floating. Maybe it's on a big mountain this time. Wait, so the ship got shipped right back to the mountain. It looks like it's a Actually, I think it does. The Bible does say it was like on a hill. Yeah. No one would know. He was there. Actually, no, it was like super, super old, too. Yeah. Yeah. They do look like toes. I'm a really great drawer. Thank you. I appreciate your help there. And so we get this story in God's creation that God is really sad. And he says, I'm never going to flood the earth again. I don't want all of creation to die. But God's heart was grieved deeply before that happened. Then we get to number four. And we find out about this guy named Abram, who later becomes Abraham. And God says, you are going to have as many descendants as the stars in the sky. So our next symbol is I like stars, you like stars, everybody likes stars. Everybody loves you like stars for real, Noah. It's probably because your story happens and then it's like a little bit later we get some stars. So Abram takes God's people from a place called Ur all the way down south into a place called Canaan. Canaan. And that becomes God's location which is actually where Jesus was born. We'll talk about that later. But we get into this story and we find out 
that he is old and he has no kids, and yet how is he going to have all these descendants? And if you looked on the stars up in the sky tonight, which is rainy, so you're not going to be able to, so we won't go outside because I don't want to get wet. You would see star after star after star. Did anybody ever been to the beach? Another part in scripture says the descendants would be as numerous as the sand on the shore. You've ever picked up a big old scoop of sand and thrown it at your sibling? There's so much sand. You've ever done that? I've done that like three times. I've done that <laughs> So, yeah, I did yell that too. My parents didn't like when I did that. So, fast forward in the story. We're going through the Old Testament really quick. We're going to go through a book called Exodus in this next one. And so, in Exodus, it is all about this guy named Moses. Anybody ever heard of the name Moses? Most of you have. Moses comes onto the scene and God is like, hey, we're going to make you become this person who helps out the Israelites, helps out the Jewish people, helps out, these are all the same words, the Hebrews. And so a bunch of stuff happens in the story. His birth story is crazy. The king, the pharaoh, wants to kill every single boy because the Israelites are becoming so numerous. So he creates genocide and kills every boy two years and older or younger and pretty much has them thrown into the Nile to die because there are beautiful things called crocodiles. No two things about the Nile, the Nile flows up north and there are crocodiles. Crocodiles eat babies because babies can't defend themselves against crocodiles. Just that. Yeah. They may drown them first. I did not go through the logical steps of an alligator does. You might be accurate on that. Okay. Are you okay, guys? Yeah. I know. Y'all need to separate. Y'all know you need to separate. You're the best. So, we get to this story about Moses, and Moses kills an Egyptian. He sees an injustice happen, and he kills one of the Egyptians. He buries him in the sand. The next day, he goes back out and sees two Israelites fighting. And they said, what are you going to do? The same thing that the, who did to the Egyptian, to us. And then he kind of runs away because he found out that he was a murderer, and murderers normally run. So he runs to a place called Midian, and he meets a priest, and his family marries the priest's daughter. And about 40 years rolls by. Oh, that's right. So he's like 40 at the time. Now he's like 80. And he goes on this place. And he goes up on a hill. And he begins to see a bush. And a, this is a beautiful bush today. And the bush does something weird. Has anybody ever seen something catch fire? What happens when things catch fire? Do they eventually burn out? Don't do that, ever. So, when something burns, it disintegrates over time, correct? If something has to be consumed, what happens is there's this huge fire, and the fire does not get consumed, the, the, the bush does not get consumed. So there's like this miracle occurring that he sees this, and God says, hey guys, listen up. He says, take off your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. And he takes off his shoes and he begins to learn about who God is and that God is going to help save the Israelites. The Israelites are enslaved. Has anybody ever heard of slavery before? A really, really bad thing. And they are enslaved and he begins to set them free from their enslavement. And the goal is that they would go back up to that promised land that Abram was promised in Canaan. They get back to that land. And they have these people called judges. And the judges are not like the judges across the street at the courthouse. These judges rule a little bit more harshly back then. They had to. They didn't have a gavel thing. They would carry around a sword. They would help bring order. There would be, uh, then there would be something called kings that people wanted to have a king just like all the other nations have. Uh, then God sent prophets. 
And they had prophets that told them about what was going to happen, who this Messiah would be, who and what God was up to. And so there were lots of predictions, foretelling and foretelling. We talked about that last week. But one of the things that happened in this segment is that people would go in this cyclical cycle of sin. You guys might remember this. Crying out to God. And then what happened? Anybody remember? God rescues them. So sometimes God would send them a judge. Sometimes God would send them a prophet. And then later would send them kings to help bring them back on track. To take away their sin in the sense to tell them that they were doing wrong. The eyeball is prophet. So this one's three. So you have uh, judge, king, prophet. Bad spelling. Wait, why is the eye prophet? Because the prophets, I talked about this last time we met. It's about foretelling and foretelling. Which means they sometimes see into the future and then they sometimes proclaim truth. So they were doing kind of two different things at once. Yes. I gained profit. What? Money. You, yeah, that's a different type of profit. But yes, that's spelled like this. It, it, it's a little different than this. Oh, that says prop. Oh, it says profit. It's a little different. This is all about the money, the bling bling. And this is all about telling the truth. So. Okay, now we are finally to the part where we're going to talk about the next thing. Are you ready? Yes. 400 years of silence. Everybody has to be silent for four seconds. That was hard to do, wasn't it? Imagine 400 years. Since the last prophet foretold what was going to happen 400 years before God brings revelation. And what happens on a not so silent night, listen up, was the birth of Jesus. A baby born in a manger, wrapped up in clothing. If you all know Luke 2 from Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about. And so, listen up. We learn about the birth of Jesus, this Messiah who had been prophesied for years. And yet it seemed like God didn't care because God was silent on the issue. You guys had four seconds of silence. Imagine God not speaking for 400 years. You know something's going to happen, but what was that? I don't know. I wanted you to like pause for four seconds to see like how hard it is to pause for four seconds. It's hard for me. So they didn't hear a word. Uh, then God begins to proclaim some stuff. In Matthew chapter 123, we hear that there is going to be a child, and this child will be called Emmanuel, which means. God with us. Yes, it's actually kind of a common name. Now you may know somebody named Emmanuel. And, and guys, listen up. This is what's really crazy. So remember we talked about kings a minute ago? They said that Jesus would be the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lord, that Jesus will be the ultimate king. These kings failed. David failed. Solomon failed. All of Solomon's children failed many times over. Fantastic. There's lots of people named David. It's pretty amazing. You have something. Guess who he's probably named after? Probably King David. Maybe. Maybe not. The kids in your class. Who's Hattie named after? Esther. See, sometimes people name people after. Does it tickle? Wait. John. No, so about the I don't know who Matthew would have been named after. John. Oh, John. See, John. Matthew named after Ben's dad. Okay, let's get back on focus. So, God began to save the world through an infant. Can you imagine that God would send his son as a baby? 
Babies are like defenseless. We talked about babies a minute ago getting eaten by alligators or crocodiles, right? And like you said, they would drown them first. But like a baby has to be watched and supervised. Like you're not gonna let your baby run around and go crazy. But listen up. This baby, this baby came into the earth. Guys, listen up. And this baby becomes the savior of the universe. Christmas is almost here. You may already have a Christmas tree, lights, decorations up. But sometimes, guess what? We get so caught up in all of the hype, the Black Friday shopping, that often we forget about Jesus. No, we don't. No, seriously, listen up. We really, guys, listen up. We really honestly forget about Jesus in the midst of everything else. It's just the truth. We forget who Jesus was, what he did, and why he came. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. This is one of the most famous read portions of the Bible in the early church. A lot of people would call this the Christ hymn. Many people believe this was sung out loud in Greek. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. Though he was God, he did not think equality of God something to be clung to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took a humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he was humbled in obedience to God. He died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest honor and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. And every time we declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That entire thing I just read is what Jesus did. Jesus came, though he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be clung to. Which pretty much means, even though he was the same page as who God was, fully God, fully human, he didn't take that and run with it. He could have made everybody at that time do whatever he wanted. He had all of that power, and yet he served. He took the humble position of a human being and served. My position is Humility is one of those things that is actually really hard to do because the first time you start saying that you're humble, you're normally prideful. And when you normally think that you're better than somebody else, you're honestly very unhumble. And so, Jesus came, guys, we're almost done, focus in. Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, it means he did not sin, he did not do anything wrong. He did not go against God's way. But guess what, the people of God were crying out for God to rescue them. And God rescues them through a baby born in a stable, a dirty, nasty stable. Where cows and sheep and whatever else live. So at, during this Christmas season, I want to encourage you to do three things. This is it. To think on why God would send Jesus. To see that God truly loves you, that he would send his son. And lastly, to know that God has a plan for you. Again, think on why Jesus was sent. Think on why God truly loves you and think about God's plan for your life. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you came. That us being in sin, undeserving of who you are, Jesus, we thank you that you came. That you died on the cross for us. That your love and your life brings new life to us. That we were dead in our sins and yet we become alive in you and we thank you for that. Jesus, we ask that you would bless us as we go forth in our evening and just thank you for all that you do. In your name we pray. Amen. No.